Yeah, a lot of uncertainty, uh, I think, in the next few months. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Comstock Channel. I'm Marlon Bolding with you. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Well, today I have Laura Edwards with me, and she happens to be the South Dakota state climatologist. And we're going to talk a little about, well, the weather as we get ready for this growing season coming up. It's kind of ironic, Laura, that we're talking about the growing season when, as we record this, we're just coming through some of the coldest temps of the winter. Um, in some areas, it has been a winter to remember, hasn't it? Quite a few ups and downs this winter. Um, and February certainly has been marked with colder than average temperatures in the Northern Plains region, uh, specifically Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and around that area. Um, but you know, looking back earlier in the in the winter season, we had pretty warm conditions um, to start with, then cold. Um, you know, right before Thanksgiving, then warm, then cold around Christmas. So we've kind of gone back and forth. But here, the last few weeks, we've held pretty steady on the colder temperatures here in the north central part of the country. Um, I know that's not true everywhere, but along with that too, we've had um, pretty low precipitation. Uh, we're behind average for snowfall uh, across much of the north central region as well. So um, we're seeing some very deep frost depths um, that we haven't seen in a couple of years. Nothing really record breaking at this point, but um, a, more of a typical winter that I think this year um, than we've seen in, in a couple of years. Is that just due to the lack of moisture in the topsoil or what? Yeah, it's partly due to the lack of snow cover. Um, so there's basically no insulation on the soil at this point. You know, this winter, so frost was able to set in early. Um, also, yeah, you're right. Having dry soils encourages or enhances rapid frost, and so we saw deep frost depths uh, really plummet quickly, especially in that December cold period. There, uh, in late December, we saw um, frost depths really, really get fast. Um, get deep fast, I should say. Um, you know, some of our data here in South Dakota shows t uh, frost depths around three to four feet or so uh, across the state. There's some variability. We have some areas that are deeper than five feet at this point. Um, so, so yeah, we're we're seeing it lock in uh, this year. My goodness. Um, you know, not only the northern plains, but I've heard a lot of people in the let's say the western half of the Midwest. They've been complaining about how dry it is this winter. Uh, like in Iowa, they're a little worried about the precip here over the past few months. I think uh, the lack of snow cover across the landscape, you know, we, we talk about, you know, spring and summer moisture a lot in agriculture as being really essential for our crop and, and hay and, and, and water supplies for the season, but you know, having a snowpack on the ground at this time of year is kind of a natural reservoir for water. And uh, we don't have that back up right now. We have drought conditions lingering um, across much of this region from the fall season. And so we have dry soils, not a lot of water uh, sitting on top of the ground in, in snow. And so I think dry conditions starting off this next growing season are of high concern across the region. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the term snowpack. Um, I always like to talk every year about the snowpack levels in the Rockies. That's our bank for moisture for uh, the coming summer. Uh, that's what leads to the snow melt, leads to the river flows uh, through the plains. Kind of a lifeline, if you will. How is the snowpack in the, the Rockies here this winter so far? Pretty close to average, if not. In the, the Northwest has had um, a pretty good snow year. And so uh, up in that area, they, they've been pretty decent. You know, the Northern Rockies up in the Montana region feed into the Missouri River, um, which goes right through the Northern Plains region. But also looking further south um, in the Colorado River area, um, they have seen some dryness this season in the Southern Rockies, so I think that's a little bit of a different story down there. Um, but look at the Mississippi headwaters, you know, you're looking more in that Minnesota area, and there they, they've not had, any, not had as much um, as snowfall as, as typical up in that area either. So Northern Rockies, I think, are okay. Southern Rockies, 
you know, headwaters of the Mississippi may be a little different story. Well, and that leads me to the latest information that came out from the Climate Prediction Center. Um, and it's, I, I always call it the ENSO update, the El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, Diagnostic Discussion, they call it. Uh, so anyway, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Index has to do with ocean temperatures in the Pacific Ocean, um, a lot of it based along the equator, and then in the southern areas, they do a lot of measuring. And the overall synopsis that came out in this report that came out in mid-February, it says La Nina conditions are expected to persist in the near term with a transition to ENSO neutral, in other words, halfway between La Nina and El Nino, likely during March to May of this spring. For one thing, I didn't know we were still in La Nina. Um, so is that indicative of what we've been seeing this winter with kind of a, it seems like the jet stream is running further south than normal this winter. We have had La Nina conditions and we're just kind of hanging on by a thread. Um, this winter, it's been a weaker La Nina um, than than typical, and so the impacts, I think, were really kind of slow in coming. Um, but as we look at February, for uh, for example, so far, at least here in the Northern Plains where I'm at, um, February tends to have um, the highest correlation of La Nina impacts, which here is colder than average temperatures. So very much consistent with um, what we have seen historically on average anyway for La Nina. Um, yeah, the earlier winter, as I said, had a lot of variability, uh, didn't really narrow in on anything. Um, but La Nina often also brings wetter conditions in the northwest, drier conditions in the southwest, um, and warm and dry across the southern along the Gulf states. So we have seen some of that really kind of uh, develop more recently or last couple of weeks. Um, but, you know, as you said, the, the Climate Prediction Center's discussion that came out recently indicates that La Nina will be waning in the spring season, and that's very typical um, for La Nina and El Nino, too, in both cases. We see the strongest impacts of both of those phenomenon happen in the winter season, fade in the spring, and summer is often a time of transition. Um, so, so seeing ENSO neutral conditions, essentially, you know, kind of near average sea surface temperatures in that summer season is not too unusual. Um, but it also removes or, or takes away some of our predictability skill, you know, in that season as well. We kind of lose that ocean indicator, um, you know, knowing the oceans um, move a little slower as far as changing temperature and, and they can change our jet stream and another um, other weather patterns, and so without that predictability piece, um, that offers a little more uncertainty for the summer season. Well, we also have some other things going on that are even maybe a little more bigger picture. Um, we are just basically at the peak of an 11-year solar maximum right now. Uh, solar uh, sunspot activity has really been active here over the past year. We had the big solar storms, of course, last, uh, what was it, last May. Had another big one here just uh, a short time ago. Um, but some have been saying that uh, the Earth is actually going through kind of a, a polar shift as well. The magnetic poles are moving a little bit. That makes our magnetic fields around the Earth weaker, which leads to more impact from solar storms and stuff like that. I just wondered if uh, you do any uh, work or research into how much that can affect what's going on with the weather and turned upside down or not. Don't look into that too much. I mean, I enjoy seeing the aurora, um, you know, and all those other kind of solar-related uh, phenomenon. Um, but, it, yeah, when it comes to more of these climate outlook uh, type of conversations, uh, we tend to look at, at variability of oceans and atmospheres, you know, here on, on the planet a little closer. Um, and sometimes those can overwhelm, you know, that variability that we see in the in the Earth's atmosphere and oceans can overwhelm or override uh, some of that some of those other factors that you mentioned um, so yeah I haven't seen anything uh, 
lately, I guess, about the, the solar cycles um, and sunspot activity um, related to the climate outlook this year. Let's, uh, let's talk about this upcoming rowing season here. So when you read that uh, they're calling for ENSO neutral by March through May of this year, does that kind of lead you to believe that we're basically looking at a pretty average growing season then across the Midwest this year? Yeah, it kind of depends where you're at. <laughs> um, you know, looking at the the outlooks for the spring season, which I will say will be updated here pretty soon at later this week. So um, there may be an update coming. But, um, you know, looking at March, and April, and May, the, that three-month season right now, there's a lot of uncertainty in kind of the the central north central part of the of the country, um, they're still kind of hanging on um, some La Nina um, lingering kind of some La Nina influence kind of lingering even after it's kind of officially declared gone. Sometimes there's some delayed impacts that follow on, and so that includes you know some wetter conditions in the southern Great Lakes, Ohio River Valley. I know we've seen quite a lot of flooding in Kentucky here just recently. Um, but also dryness in the four corner states. Um, so that bleeds kind of into, you know, western Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma. Um, so a couple different things going on there as we look into that spring season um, for climate. You know, as we come out of winter in the plains, do you see a lot of moisture or fluctuations between really cold and damp and, and warm weather and and not so damp, a lot of times that can create hardship on livestock if it changes up and down and and do that real quickly. Yeah, I, I do see some of that uncertainty in the north central states. So I'm looking at, you know, the Dakotas, Minnesota, Iowa, for example. Um, the, the long range outlooks, you know, three, four months or so for these regions, for those states, I should say, um, really feel a, a lot of uncertainty so yeah that point that tells me just like you say um that we'll we'll see some ups and downs um as we get into that spring season but you know up here in the dakotas people are already starting calving um you know as cold as it is that's unfortunate timing but usually if they're calving this early they're ready and they have the the facilities to handle that um but uh, yeah, we're getting into the calving and lambing season, and and there's a lot of factors to consider. But yeah, a lot of uncertainty, uh, I think, in the next few months. Now, do you consider us to be in a in a high amplitude jet stream right now? Uh, it, it seems like there's some pretty wild waves in that thing as these storms come through. Yeah, really. You know, just looking very recently, you know, there's really cold, dry air up in the north central was very wet strong uh, strong pattern going through Kentucky, you know, causing some flooding and, and some more weather coming down this week. Um, you know, we've seen some very heavy precipitation amounts in the Pacific Northwest this winter. Yeah, we're, we're seeing um, some very strong weather patterns uh, come off this winter. Um, again, not too, new, you know, in the winter, we do tend to see more of these strong cold fronts. Um, you know, bringing more significant weather across across the country. As we get into that spring season, we start to see more of that thunderstorm uh, type activity, con, you know, convection we call it, uh, more localized type of weather uh, that can have some bigger local influences anyway, and maybe not so cohesive, maybe not so pulled together in a large scale fashion. Um, so, so that's another challenge in the spring outlook is that transition from kind of this winter strong cold front pattern or Alberta clippers even in the north to what we see in the summer with more thunderstorm activity. Well, Laura, it's great to talk with you again. Thanks for all the information. I always enjoy talking weather with you, especially as it relates to uh, farming and ranching out in the plains and central part of the country. So I appreciate all the help and I uh, wish you all the best here this this coming year. All right. Thank you, Marlon. Great to visit with you. All right, Laura Edwards with us, the South Dakota State Climatologist, and that will do it for this episode. We thank you for joining us. For producer Brianne Jenkins, I'm Marlon Bowling. 
Take care, and we'll catch you next time on the Comstock Channel. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.